Hey guys, welcome to another VETSIM video here on the Aviation Pro channel. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to find charts, how to read and interpret them for your VETSIM flights. Let's go. So guys, I can't stress it enough. It's really, really important that you have charts next to you in aviation in general, but it's also true for your VETSIM flights. Because charts allow you to get a better idea of your flight and your position, both on the ground and in the air. On the ground, you need to know where you're gonna taxi, and in the air, you need to know where to go. For example, you need to know what your standard instrument departure looks like. You need to know what your arrival route looks like. And you need a lot of information. For example, you need to have information about the ILS and the runway that you're landing on. And if you try to do this without charts, it's gonna be very, very difficult. Having them next to you is super important. And it kind of gives you a top-down view of what your route, both on the ground and in the air, uh, looks like. So first of all, we'll take a look at how to exactly find charts. There are various resources that you can use, so let's take a look and uh, find out. Right guys, so when it comes to charts, there are various resources where you can get them. One of the most hands-on ways to get charts is to visit the website of your local division, so your local VAC or your local ARTCC. For example, the Dutch VAC, uh, the Dutch division of VATSIM, or maybe uh, VAC Austria, or for example, VAT USA. Those are all kind of websites that you can visit, which con usually contain links to charts. So we'll just click on the charts uh, button. And as you can see, there are some airports here that we can fly to. So let's say we're gonna fly from Maastricht airport. There we have a link to the um, aeronautical information publications or the AIP of Maastricht airport. And the AIP is kind of the, you know, the, the main resources where pilots can get information about the airport they fly to or from. And each and every country usually has an AIP available. Some are public, some are not really public. You have to log in or create an account. But as you can see, for the Netherlands, the AIP is available. And at the bottom here, we have some nice charts, which we can just download in PDF format. So let's take a look at another example. We have here VEC Austria. Um, usually it's either in the pilot section or maybe there's an airport section. And there we have airports. I uh, probably can view some details about your airport. So let's say uh, we want to have some charts for Innsbruck. Very nice uh, <laughs> airport to fly to. So we'll just click on that. And as you can see, we have a nice um, overview of all the charts. So this doesn't link to the AIP of Austria. This is just the charts are available on the VAC website itself. And these charts are either uh, modified by the VAC themselves or maybe indeed it gives you a direct link to the AIP of the country but uh, you can quite, quite assume that when you download charts from the VAC website they're usually quite up to date and as you can see you can see when these charts are effective so we can just download here and of course it's most easy to probably download the entire package so you can uh, yeah download the charts and print them or put them on dropbox and then view them on a uh, tablet or whatever you know that's entirely up to you so but just so you know this is a good way of finding all the charts uh, for free so another way to do it is uh, look up the AIP of a country that you're visiting uh, for example if you want to fly to the UK let's search for AIP um, UK and there you have a link with um, which takes you to all the information about the UK airports and also the charts so uh, it might take a little bit of searching to see uh, where you have to go uh, but usually it's something called AIP or AIS and then you somehow have to get through the aerodromes um, to view charts of them for example here we have the aerodrome index let's say we're gonna fly to Edinburgh and as you can see we have a nice list of charts here so this, these are very official charts these are the actual official charts that are published by the uh, main aviation authority in that, that country basically so in this case the UK and you can just download them again and uh, in PDF format and uh, as you can see it looks pretty nice another great website that I would really recommend is aircharts.org um, basically you can find a lot of charts for US airports as you can see and also some in Europe but not all the rest of the world is not really covered unfortunately but especially if you're flying in the US you can have some really yeah easy access to charts so we just uh, enter the ICAO code of the airport for example let's fly to uh, JFK and there we have all the charts um, you know nicely listed 
So for example, let's open up an uh, ILS chart here, 04 right. And as you can see, we have here that ILS chart and uh, it's effective on the 17th of August uh, 2017. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's good and up to date. So especially if you fly in the US and uh, from and to US airports, I would really recommend to use this website. So another great website is Skyvector, and as you can see, Skyvector provides a really nice overview of all the airways all over the world. And uh, you can just pump in your route right here, for example, this route from Amsterdam to Riga. And yeah, you have some really nice overview of high airways and low airways. So for example, let's zoom in a little bit here on the Netherlands. I can view a VFR chart, so this is kind of a generic VFR chart, which will, yeah, be pretty useful if you're um, trying to fly some VFR and if you go to the US you will see that uh, the VFR charts of Skyvector are actually pretty realistic and yeah um, what you would find on the VFR chart if you buy that in an uh, aviation shop for example so uh, that's pretty useful it's a great website with a, a lot of information and um, I usually use it for en route uh, charts uh, so to see where I'm flying en route. Uh, so for example, the lower airways here, but then of course we have the higher airways. So once you depart out of an airport and you've completed your standard instrument departure, then you can um, you know, view your route here at Skyvector and it's pretty, pretty useful. So I would really recommend the site. Uh, if you go to the US, uh, you can also click on the airports. You can click on the airports and then click on that airport information and usually there's some information about that airport and some of the bigger airports also contain charts so for example we have JFK here again we can click on the JFK it already comes up with a little diagram of charts and as you can see at the bottom here we have all the charts here as well so there's another source for uh, US charts and it's uh, yeah it's pretty good so make sure to check Skyvector out it's pretty useful so the charts I've shown this far are freeware basically. You can just download them from the internet. And uh, if you use any of the methods that I showed you, you should be able to get charts for your airport anywhere in the world, okay? Um, now, if you really want to have access to all charts and <laughs> basically from all over the world without having to worry about downloading them and keeping them up to date, then there is also a good payware option like Nevergraph. Nevergraph, um, you know, contains, um, will give you an option to have a subscription for flight management system data. So to update your ARAC data, and that's actually very important. Uh, we'll uh, take a look at that, in a, at that in a minute. But keeping your charts and FMS data is really up to date is really important. So um, you can get a subscription here and then basically you can just download the charts. You have a little application where you can uh, yeah, easily get all the charts of all the airports that you need and then also you can update your flight management system data so that all the waypoints that you see on the current charts are also there in your FMC because if there's old data in your FMC and you have new charts and you try to enter a waypoint you will just see that it's not able to find that waypoint it will give some kind of error so having that FMS data up to date together with the charts is very important okay but um, yeah, this is just a payware option if you um, want to uh, get this subscription, that's totally up to you. So for the FMS data, you always have to pay, unfortunately, but for the charts, you can also get them for free in the ways that I showed you. So now that you know how to find charts, we'll take a look at how to read and interpret them. So we're gonna take it step by step, uh, all the way from being on the ground at one airport to being on the ground at the other airport. And I'm gonna use my flight from Amsterdam to Riga as an example. So if you want to check out that flight, make sure you check out the description. It's a live stream, um, which I did in the Boeing 747-400. And it might be good to use the same route as an example. So we'll uh, explore the charts of both these airports. And I should say that, you know, interpreting charts for all airports should be a similar procedure. The charts might look a bit different depending on which source you use. For example, the Nevergraph charts look a lot alike. But the AIP charts or the, or the charts that you find via the VAC websites often look a little bit different. But in general, the information should be similar. So let's go ahead and take a look at those charts. All right, so let's take a, take a look at those charts. Uh, again, we're gonna take it step by step and I'm just gonna use the Amsterdam Riga route as an example. Uh, and I'm just pretending that uh, we're gonna be flying the same flight as I did in that video. 
Uh, we're gonna start here at the uh, Shera apron, which is the cargo apron, and then we're gonna take off from runway two for Amsterdam. And uh, we'll just imagine that the weather is, uh, yeah, the same as in that video, basically. So first of all, the first chart that you're really gonna encounter is the ground chart, and the ground chart gives you just a nice top-down overview of the airport or the yeah the stands at the airport. This is the airport parking docking chart, as you can see on the top. And uh, basically when you review a chart, it's best to just review it from the top to the bottom. So you can see that it's from the AIP in the Netherlands in the top left corner. We have the Amsterdam Schiphol aircraft parking docking chart at the center. There's some more parking stands in separate charts. So this is just the center of the airport. And on the right we have the date. So we have the effective date of this chart. It's the 22nd of June 2017. So when anything changes on the chart, this date gets updated. And uh, yeah, in general, if your chart is like one or two years old, you might want to check out if the chart has been updated in the meantime, because again, airports change a lot uh, usually. So uh, yeah, again, just a top down view of the airport layout. You can see all the stands at the terminals. So for example, if you're gonna start your flight at the gate, you might want to look up look up which gate that is. So, for example, I'm gonna start my flight at uh, Delta 18. This one, then you know, okay, that's Delta 18. I'm gonna have to uh, look that up on the ground chart so I know from which stand I'm gonna push back. So the rest of the chart, as you can see, it contains taxiways. So we have taxiway Alpha and Bravo, which are the main taxiways at Amsterdam. And as you can see, Alpha goes clockwise and Bravo goes uh, counterclockwise as you can see the arrow points in that direction and towards the bottom of the chart we can view some more information there are some notes that you can give a read through and uh, there are some cautions right here that you might want to review for example we have here caution 7 so let's take a look at what that is caution 7 max wingspan 61 meters only applicable to aircraft taxiing to echo 3 all right so if you are an aircraft that is a wingspan bigger than 61 meters, you know that uh, this stand, Echo 3, is not the right stand for you, all right? So yeah, just give, make sure that you know that there can be uh, additional information on the chart and also the coordinates are displayed here. So this is the ground movement chart. It's a bigger overview of the airport and we can just, uh, again, see all the taxiways. We don't see the actual stands right now, but you can see the entire taxiway structure at Amsterdam Airport. So yeah, just use this information so you know where to taxi, right? So you know, for example, uh, if we're gonna park here at the Shara apron, you know that, uh, okay, so we're gonna taxi to runway 24. In that case, we're gonna have to go this way to Shara 8, all right? And for example, if there's another uh, route, for example, we have to taxi to runway 36 left, then we know, all right, we're gonna have to go in this direction. We're gonna have to cross runway 24 then probably via Quebec or something. Maybe we're gonna taxi via Zulu all the way up or maybe we're gonna taxi via um, Alpha right here and then go via Whiskey 5, cross runway 36 enter and then to Victor. And from there we might continue uh, the route right here as according to the instructions uh, to runway 36 left. And as you can see, there's some highlights on this chart as well, right? So for example, this uh, this little inset right here, you can actually see which direction to taxi. So if you're coming from this side, you have to taxi uh, like this. You're not taxiing like this, this is the wrong direction. So if you're taxiing, uh, or if you're landing at Amsterdam and you would be vacating from uh, runway 1H right in this case, then you would be taxiing in this direction and you would not be taxiing in this direction. That's the wrong taxi direction, all right? So just be aware that there might be taxi directions stated on the chart. And yeah, in general, just what you have to remember about the ground chart is that you know that, uh, you know, your position, you kind of anticipate what taxiways you'll be using when you taxi to the active runway. And based on that information, you just know uh, what to do. And of course, air traffic controllers also might give you certain instructions. So for example, um, Let's say we're taxiing on taxiway uh, Bravo. Right here, we're taxiing on taxiway Bravo. And air traffic controller uh, tells you to give way to a KLM 737 at Alpha 5. So then you know, okay, I'm passing Alpha 4 now. 
next will be Alpha 5, so I'll have to hold here to give way to that other aircraft that might be taxiing in front of me, okay? So keep in mind that air traffic control gives you instructions, and this is why it's so important that you have this chart next to you, so you really have that top-down view of the situation. And then at the airport you can use the taxi signs, and based on that you can determine your uh, location, and then with the chart you can really see, okay, where's Alpha 5? Where do I need to give way to this in this aircraft, right? So keep that in mind. It's very, very important to have this chart next to you when you're taxiing. So then we'll go over departure charts. And um, departure charts are basically standard instrument departure charts, which show you where you have to go in order to get to the first waypoint on your route. Now, the first waypoint on our route to Riga um, is Andik. And uh, if you determine the active runway or if you receive your clearance you know which standard instrument departure you're going to be flying right so um, in this case we have this chart in front of us runway 24 actually for this runway there are two charts this is the one chart and this is the other chart as you can see uh, there are actually two routes to Andik. we have this one the spike aboard two kilo departure uh, which is a right turn after taking off from uh, runway 24 so we're going to be flying in this way and then towards Andik. And then we also have this chart, uh, which means we have to make a left turn and fly towards Andik. So as you can see, uh, for one runway, there might be multiple routes to the same waypoint. So multiple standard instrument departures to the same waypoint. So keep that in mind. Um, you will be certain about your standard instrument departure when you receive your clearance, because then the controller will really will tell you like, uh, clear to Riga via the Andik 1 Shera departure, and then you really know, okay, that's the standard instrument instrument departure that I have to use, and I should not use the spike aboard 2 kilo departure. So just keep that in mind. So the same procedure as with any other chart, just make sure you review this from the top to the bottom. So we have Skipple Runway 24 standard departure chart instrument, effective on the 22nd of June 2017. There's some very important information at the top here, and you will find similar information on other, on other charts. We have a transition altitude of 3,000 feet, uh, like this. And this is the altitude where you switch from the local QNH, the local atmospheric pressure, to the standard QNH. Now, in the US, this is always 18,000 feet, but in Europe, it's uh, different for each and every airport. So make sure you review the standard instrument departure chart so you know when to go from the local QNH, which you can get from the ATIS or the METAR of the airport. Uh, and when you switch to the standard QNH of 1013 hectopascals or 2992 inches of mercury uh, as is used in the US. Now some more information. Uh, after departure, climb to flight level 60. Okay, so really, really important. Don't climb further than flight level 60 on this um, departure uh, because there there's also arriving traffic, of course, and air traffic control needs to separate the departing and the arriving traffic in some way. So keep in mind that there might be altitude restrictions on your SID and even for specific waypoints on your SID. Then another instruction, max 250 knots below flight level 100 and that's kind of an, uh, yeah, a standard um, restriction that's always there. And uh, then for the continuation of the routes, they refer to another chart. So that's a bigger overview of all the standard instrument departures. Okay, so uh, we know this, uh, then we can take a look further at the chart. Uh, there's some more information right here, I would ignore that for now. Uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to take a look at the departure route. So we know from the clearance that we're going to fly the Andik 1 Shara departure. So what do we have to do? So let's just take it step by step. As you can see, we're going to depart from runway 24, that's this runway. And then we're going to fly heading 238 to Echo Hotel 005. As you can see, that's a waypoint. Uh, so it's just a waypoint that you will enter in your flight management system. And this is why it's so important to have a flight management system. If you're going to really want to fly these SIDs accurately and have all those waypoints up to date, it's really important that you have a flight management system with up to date data. Because if your chart is up to date, but you use the default GPS, there's no way you can fly this SID accurately and it's going to be much harder to follow altitude restrictions or speed restrictions like this one. Uh, in the next turn we can only fly at maximum 220 knots, so yeah, those are all things to keep in mind. Um, but in general, if you have an FMC and you 
I just select this departure route it will be entered automatically uh, for you and you just have to cross check with the chart whether the data in the FMC is the same as the data on the chart so just review it step by step so first we had echo hotel 005 then a left turn heading 118 to echo hotel 008 and then we'll continue uh, after um, some point to pompous VOR and as you can see this pompous VOR is uh, this guy over here and we basically fly inbound to this VOR on the 220 degree radial so that's a radial that goes from the VOR station um, and yeah we'll talk about VOR in the next video but uh, yeah, the basic idea is that you fly inbound to this VOR station and then later on uh, after passing the pompous VOR you can fly uh, outbound radio, outbound radio 015 as you can see here and then we'll be flying towards Andik. Okay, so that's just a general overview of this SID. Just make sure that you review this SID. If you have an FMS with uh, a SID selected then you can automatically fly this SID um, and it's not really a problem. Um, but just make sure you're aware of this route and aware of all the restrictions on run along the route so you don't fully depend on automation. Now let's take a look at some more information on this chart. As you can see, we can see in the coordinates of the waypoints, we have some frequencies right here. Now in general, you will use VPilot to look up the frequencies probably, but you can already see there are quite a lot of different frequencies at Amsterdam in the real world. Uh, but as you can see, you know, just keep in mind have this departure chart in front of you, make sure you know what your route is, is, what the restrictions are, and make sure you cross check with your FMS to make sure that all the data is correct, all right? So after you've flown your route, it's uh, time to look at the arrival. And the arrival and approach charts are often quite uh, extensive and there's a lot of information on them. But just again, use the same procedure, review it from the top uh, to the bottom. So you make sure you don't miss any information. So let's take a look. So as you can see, this chart is from AIP Latvia. We have the standard arrival chart instrument, the star chart, and the star, the standard terminal arrival route, will take you from the last waypoint on your route to the uh, runway, basically. Well, to the initial approach fix of the runway. So um, it's very important to have this chart next to you. As you can see, the transition altitude is 5,000 feet. Uh, when descending, you use the transition level. You have to listen to the ATIS to get this transition level, and that's the point where you're gonna switch from the standard QNH to the local QNH. So that's the exact opposite of the transition altitude. And then we have some frequencies right here. We have approach, tower, and ATIS, and we have uh, Riga, uh, runway 18. Let's we presume that runway 18 is active, and we're gonna. Uh, fly to that runway and fly that star. So here in this box you have a description of the uh, stars and uh, our last waypoint on our route for today is uh, the Orvix waypoint. So we're going to be flying the Orvix to Alpha arrival. And basically what this entails is the following. Uh, after passing Orvix proceed on track 079 to the Tango Uniform Kilo VOR and then on the Tango Uniform Kilo uh, VOR Radio 051, we track to Gudin. And that's the initial approach fix. And the initial approach fix is just, just the um, yeah, fix where the waypoint where you're going to start the actual final approach. And as you can see, uh, it comes with some altitude and restrictions. Again, this is why it's important to have a flight management system. We can see we have to cross Tango Uniform Kilo VOR at or above flight level 90. And then Gudin, the initial approach fix at or above 2,500 feet, right? So yeah, that's uh, the basic idea of this uh, standard terminal rival route. But this is just a dead text description. Let's actually take a look at how um, from the top-down view. So here we have the top-down view again, um, and we can actually see the route that we have to fly. Uh, again, if you enter this standard terminal rival route and this approach in your FMC properly, it will probably show up and. Uh, can just cross check with the FMC whether the data is all correct but it's always good to give a good review of the standard terminal arrival route so you know where you're going and uh, you know about all the altitude instructions so for this particular standard terminal arrival route we're going to start at Orvix waypoint right here and then we're going to fly to the Tango Uniform Kilo VOR 
which is this VOR right here. And um, basically we have to cross this VOR at flight level 90 or above. And as you can see, um, there's a little line below this flight level 90. That means you cannot descend further than this line. So it's flight level 90 or above. So the way it works with altitude restrictions and how they are displayed on the uh, departure chart is kind of like this. For example, uh, we have uh, flight level 90 as at this Tango Uniform Kilo VOR. When there's a line under the flight level, it means that you cannot descend further than that flight level. So it's flight level 90 or above. It doesn't matter whether you're above here or not, but you cannot descend further. Uh, that's not going to happen. So flight level 90 or above. And you will also see this in the FMC. You will actually see this A sign next to the flight level, meaning above. Uh, when there is um, a restriction where you uh, have to fly uh, below this flight level, so then when there will be a line on top. So this means flight level 90 or below. So you can fly anywhere below this flight level, but you cannot fly above this flight level. This is going to be indicated in the FMC with a B, so flight level 90 or below. And finally, there can also be two lines, and this means that you have to fly at flight level 90 at a particular waypoint. So you cannot fly above, but you cannot fly below either. All right, so uh, keep that in mind um, that when there are two lines on this flight level, you cannot fly uh, yeah, above or below this flight level at this waypoint. Uh, and then as you can see on the chart, there's some other waypoints with restrictions right here. For example, this one, it means uh, 5,000 feet or above. Uh, this one is 7,000 feet or above. Uh, so yeah, just make sure you know about these altitude restrictions. So when we cross this Tango Uniform Kilo VOR, also called SMARDE, then we um, fly outbound at VOR on the 051 degrees radial, as you can see right here. And then we're going to track towards the Gudin waypoint. That's this one right here, uh, like that. So we're just going to fly to that waypoint. And from there, we're going to start the approach. And therefore, we have to go to the next chart. Uh, but just to make sure that you know um, about this chart, make sure you review all the information that is stated on here. So first of all, make sure you know your actual routes. So we're going to fly like this, basically. Make sure you're aware of the altitude and speed restrictions along that star. And make sure that also coincides with the information that you've entered in the flight management system. And then also make sure you review some of the general information. So the frequencies, for example, um, there's some general information like here, right here. Approach without radar control is carried out via Smarter VOR DME or via the Romeo India Alpha VOR DME. Okay, so yeah, that's some information to keep in mind. Again, there's a speed restriction also applicable here. Speed restriction is there that you have to be at 250 knots below flight of 100. So not higher than 250 knots below this altitude, right? So yeah, very important information on the star chart. So this is really about the initial part of your approach. All right, and then we'll go over to the next chart and this is the approach chart. Now the approach chart can be anything like the ILS approach or VOR DME approach, an RNF approach or whatever. Um, it really depends on which type of approach you're going to fly. Uh, I'm just going to show you an ILS approach. It's the most common type of approach that you will find. And basically this chart will take you from the initial approach fix to the runway. So as you can see, if we zoom in here, we're starting at Gudin, and then we'll basically be able to fly to the runway. So especially for the ILS chart or any approach chart like this, it's really important that you review this very, very carefully. Uh, so I'm going to do it quite detailed in this video. Uh, as you can see, we have an instrument approach chart. We have the aerodrome elevation uh, right here, uh, which is important to put in your pressurization panel of your aircraft, for example, so that the pressurization is correctly regulated. And it also contains some information about um, the threshold elevation. Then we have some uh, frequencies right here, which may be handy, for example, the ATIS. And we know that this is an ILS uh, chart for runway 18. We assume that runway 18 is active at Riga. And then we also have the uh, effective date, 25th of May, 2017. So this part of the chart, the upper part, uh, really contains all the information about uh, the route with the top-down view again. But there's a lot of text up here. So some information, for example, that all the elevations and the altitudes are in feet, distances are in nautical miles. Uh, we have the minimum sector altitude here. It's kind of the, 
it indicates uh, which altitude it's safe to fly in relation to a VOR station and the VOR station that they use here is the Romeo India Alpha VOR, the Riga VOR, uh, which is right here. So basically if you would draw uh, these uh, courses to these VOR station, you know that in this sector it's the minimum sector altitude is 1700 feet so as long as you're above 1700 feet it's safe to fly and clear of obstacles and right here it's uh i'm just going to remove that it's 2300 feet so in this part is which kind of uh, kind of is this sector basically so this entire sector uh you're at a safe minimum sector altitude is 2300 so you know that it's safe to fly there all right so this is quite an important part of the uh, ap approach charts. You can also find that on the bar charts. Um, basically, also on the approach chart, you see a lot of things like you see the terrain, of course. You know that here is the sea, so that you can keep that in mind. Uh, what else can we see? We can see some airspaces right here. Basically, the red airspaces are the airspaces you don't want to go, go to, for example, because those are military airspaces, whatever, they train there. Uh, you can see also, if we zoom in a bit further, you can also see a lot of um, obstacles. So, for example, here's an, uh, uh, right here there's a tower with, with a top altitude of 394 feet. So, you know that, uh, you know, if you fly low over that region, you need to uh, keep the tower in uh, sight and you make sure you don't hit it. Another one right here, for example. But the most important part for us is, of course, to make sure that we can fly our route properly. So as you could see from the previous start, we start here at uh, the Gudin waypoint. And then basically what we're going to do is we're going to fly uh, heading 133. And then we're going to intercept the ILS to this runway, runway 18, which is over here. And we're going to intercept that ILS uh, this way. Okay. So what you need, what the most important things f that you need from an ILS chart are the inbound course and the frequency. So you can see the frequency is here at the bottom. So the frequency for this ILS at this runway is 111.1. So you tune that in the navigation radios. And it also comes with an identifier. In this case, it's the India Romeo Victor. So when you tune in that ILS, you will see India Romeo Victor and then you know Okay, that's the identifier of this ILS. And then the course to the runway, which you can enter in the course section of your mode control panel, for example, if you're flying the 737, the inbound course to this ILS of runway 18 is 178. So that's, of course, very important information. And basically, from this uh, top-down view, you can just uh, have a good overview of your route. We have here also the missed approach uh, procedure, basically. So if we cannot land at runway 18 due to whatever reason, and we have to climb straight ahead basically uh, like this and then we fly over to this waypoint to rugby so uh, we'll also take a look at the missed approach procedure in text format but as you can see it's already important we have to be at 1200 feet or above and then we're going to make a left a little left turn to intercept this radial out of the riga vor radial uh, 173 and then we end up at rugby and we're probably going to hold there and uh, decide from there what we're going to do. There's some other important text boxes uh, right here. For example, DME is required. So your aircraft has to be equipped with distance measuring equipment, uh, which basically allows you to measure the, measure the distance from um, you know, the ILS to your aircraft. If you don't have that, it's going to be kind of uh, hard to determine at which point to descend exactly. And um, yeah, you just need to know the distance from the runway. Um, and there's also a warning here, which you have to keep in mind. When established on the ILS, maintain 160 knots until 4 DME. So as you can see, that's why the DME is <laughs> important. You need to know the distance. So um, what this means is that you have to keep 160 knots until 4 DME from India Romeo Victor. Again, India Romeo Victor is the ILS that we're flying, the identifier. So if you had 4 DME, then you can start reducing to your final approach speed, which for example is about 135 knots. Uh, but before v 4 DME, then you have to um, maintain at least 160 knots. So as you can see already, this chart is pretty complex and uh, we're not done yet, unfortunately. <laughs> this is kind of the most important part of this chart with the vertical profile and it will contain a lot of information that you require for your approach. So let's just go through it step by step. Again, we have the transition altitude uh, right here. Um, 
again, if you descend, you will use the transition level by ATIS. Uh, but uh, you know, usually the transition altitude is also portrayed on the chart. We have the missed approach procedure right here in text. So give that a read through. It should coincide with the missed approach procedure that is reviewed on top right here. So in this case, we're going to climb on track 178 to 1200. And then at 1200, we turn left to intercept the outbound radio 173 from uh, the Riga VOR and then proceed to Rugby, climbing to 2500 and follow ATC instructions. So very important to keep this in mind so that you know what to do when you have to go around because you can always expect to go around when there's an aircraft blocking the runway, for example. You know, it can always happen. Uh, we have some more information like the ILS RDH that kind of indicates what your altitude should be above the threshold, so 52 feet. And we have the threshold elevation of 31 feet. Now the vertical profile is uh, probably the most important uh, part of this. Uh, as you can see, uh, we kind of arrive from 5,000 5, feet and then you descend further, eventually ending up at 2,500 feet. And uh, then at 2,500 feet, that's where you kind of start your approach from. So usually on the chart, uh, the point at which you're going to descend on the glide slope is indicated by the final approach fix or final approach point, for example, right here, FAP. And that's the point where you're going to start descent. And as you can see, uh, that is 7.4 nautical miles from the threshold of runway 18. So you can nicely see the distance on this uh, graph as well. So yeah, it's pretty useful. Again, here you can see that we have to follow the 178 course and the glide path is in three degree, three degree glide slope. That's kind of a standard glide slope. If um, you fly into London City, this degree will be higher. Um, but for a standard ILS approach, this is usually three degrees. So you know, okay, my aircraft will be able to handle this. Now next we have a lot of information about minimums and it's going to be very important of course uh, because at this point you're going to decide whether you're going to land or not. So if you do not see the runway at minimums or, or you see that an aircraft or a vehicle is blocking the runway at minimums, you can dec decide to go around and otherwise you will just decide to continue the landing. And this is basically determined by this table over here. It contains all the information about the uh, missed approach altitudes. So the way this works is you first have to look at the aircraft category and this uh, aircraft category is kind of based on the final approach speed of your aircraft. For example, uh, for the 737, this is usually aircraft category C. That's for aircraft flying between 121 and 140 knots. And then uh, for aircraft flying between 141 and 165 knots, there, that's category D. So that's, for example, um, used for the 747. So you first determine which aircraft category you are. So let's say we're aircraft category C today, because we're flying the 737. Then you have to determine which type of ILS approach you're going to fly. Now, um, the, the ILS approach categories, uh, you might want to look that up, what that exactly is. Basically, the higher the category, so uh, category 3, for example, the more accurate that approach is going to be. Um, so category 1 is the least accurate type of ILS approach and then category 2 is kind of in the middle and category 3 is a very accurate type of ILS approach and basically this is determined by the equipment on the ground at the airport how accurate and certified that is it has uh, you know you need to fly a certified aircraft to do category 3 approach the crew has to be certified as well so a lot of factors are taken into account when it comes to ILS categories but which ILS category you fly basically is determined by the uh, runway visual range, uh, the RVR at that moment at the runway. So in very low visibility, uh, and if your RVR is, for example, less than 200 meters, you're going to have to fly a category 3 approach. In this case, this runway only has two categories, category 1 and 2, but in general, I would just pick the category 1 approach that's kind of the standard type of approach that you would fly. So the way this table works is we just select category 1, ILS category 1, and then we know that the minimums are 231 feet or 200 and, uh, feet radio altitude. Now what's the difference between the, the number here 231 and the number 200 in brackets? Well it refers to obstacle clearance altitude and obstacle clearance height. This is also often noted as this um, decision 
altitude or decision height. Now altitude refers to altitude above sea level and this is based on the altitude of your altimeter which is um, you know based on the pressure that you put in there so the QNH. So it's very important for um, these type of approaches that you really select the correct QNH based on the latest info that you receive from air traffic control. And the height and the one within brackets it refers to the altitude above ground level and this is measured by the radio altimeter in your aircraft basically this radio altimeter sends out the beam to the ground and then this beam bounces back to the aircraft and from that information it can determine what the distance is um, between the aircraft and the ground um, so yeah you just need to know the difference between these two and the main thing here is that if you're using category one approach you usually use the barrow setting inside of your aircraft you put in this altitude right here 231 feet um, and if you're gonna fly category two or three approaches they usually use the radio altimeter so they use the radio functions of the minimums and then you have to select the obstacle clearance height or the decision height so that's really the altitude above ground level instead of above mean sea level. So just keep that in mind. Uh, let's take a look at another example. For example, we're at 747, we're flying category D. We're going to be flying ILS category 2 approach because the visibility is uh, very poor at Riga. Uh, so in that case, we're going to be having a um, misapproach altitude of 160 feet uh, on the barrow and a misapproach uh, yeah, obstacle clearance height of 129 feet in the radio uh, altimeter. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Uh, it will probably become more clear once I uh, do this and show this in the full flight video at the end of the series. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just keep in mind that the altitude that is not in brackets is about obstacle clearance altitude. So the altitude above a mean sea level and the one within brackets refers to the altitude above ground level and this is called height. So that's the main difference there. And then on the rest of the chart, we have some more information right here. Um, so for example, um, based on the DME and the distance, you can see what your altitude should be. So this is just another cross reference. So you can see, hey, I'm at three miles from the DME of India, Romeo Victor, IRV. What should by my altitude be? So three DME, my altitude should be uh, 1050. Okay. Then we also have here some more information. So um, what your speed is, so for example, if we're flying at 140 knots, our rate of descent should be about 740 feet per minute. So we know when you're flying the aircraft for the approach that you have to maintain about 740 feet per minute. So as you can see, this approach plate is very complex. There's a lot of information on there. So again, just review it step by step and just do RLS approaches and uh, look up unfamiliar terms that you find on this approach plate on Google, you will often find an answer to your question about that. Just keep in mind, review it carefully and step by step. That way you will really learn about all the little perks that you will find on approach plates like this. Once you've landed, you can use the ground chart again to navigate your way to the gate. And uh, so we can just take a look. All right, you know, when you approach the airport, you can do an approach briefing for yourself to see uh, hey, where I'm going to go when I land. So, um, for example, I already know that this apron right here is the cargo apron. So when I land at runway 18, I'll probably vacate here at Charlie or maybe I'll vacate here at Bravo. I'm not really sure, uh, but I know that uh, I'll just go over to the lower section. For example, if I taxi via Bravo, then I have to continue taxi via Foxtrot and then I'll continue all the way taxi to the apron, so I'll probably get taxiway echo and then to one of these stands right here. And of course, you don't know the exact stands usually, but you do know, uh, you know, when you land, what you can kind of expect. So just keep in mind uh, when you do the approach briefing, also make sure you review the ground chart again of the other airport, and you have a kind of idea where to go when to vacate, when you vacate, and you kind of have a basic idea of the airport layout, so you're not you know, get surprised when you land at the airport. So guys, I hope that was helpful. And uh, again, make sure you have those charts next to you on your first Vetson flight, but also before that, you know, make sure you give a review of the charts so you kind of know what to do before you actually make your flight. It's very, very important. So now that we have all the charts, we can take a look at flight plan and we're gonna do that in the next video. We're gonna take a look at how to make a flight plan using uh, 
your flight planning tools such as SimBrief or like I'm just going to be showing you that in PFPX. And then we're going to also take a look at how to file a flight plan to the VETSIM servers because of course the controllers need to know where you're actually going. So we'll take a look at that in the next video. So guys, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you check out some of my other VETSIM videos here on the Aviation Pro channel. And if you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them below. If you'd like to support the Aviation Pro channel, make sure you check out the description for different ways of doing so. Thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you on the next one.